Well, after years of hemming and hawing, the U.S. finally has a law that says all new cars have to have one of those, a backup camera. Here's how it's going to work. The camera must show an area at least 10 feet wide and 20 feet back. The image has to linger on the screen for four to eight seconds after you shift back out of reverse. That screen may be in dash, or it could just be a portion of your rear view mirror in a car that doesn't have a dash LCD. By May 2016, 10% of all new cars must have cameras. By May 2017, 40%. And by May 2018, all of them. But even without this law, the feds predict some 73% of new cars would have cameras in them voluntarily by 2018. So we're talking about working the last 27% or so with this regulation. Now the cost. If a vehicle just needs this little camera installed and already has a screen somewhere to show it on, it adds maybe 40 bucks to the price of a car. If the vehicle also needs a screen installed and the camera, it's more like $140 ballpark. Now, if you watch many of our videos, you know that an increasing number of cars have these cameras in already standard and many offer them optionally. So we're talking about moving the margin to full compliance by 2018. 210 people die in back over accidents each year. But these cams are only expected to save maybe a third of those lives. A recent visibility study by the IIHS shows the unparalleled coverage of a camera compared to any of your three mirrors, or a glance over the shoulder, or those beeping bumper sensors. The camera handily beats them all. Now, generally speaking, little cars like this Honda Fit have less of a need for rear cameras than big cars like a big truck or SUV, but there are exceptions. The IIHS found that a Hyundai Sonata had 42% more of a blind spot where you could totally lose an infant than a Ford F-150 pickup. So there are some weird anomalies out there. I think every car can use a rear camera and it's not overkill. Even in a little car like this Honda Fit, you've always got a back seat, you've got a bumper, you've got a rear transom piece of sheet metal. You can't see through that stuff, Superman. So there's always a significant place where especially little kids and pets can get lost like that. I don't think rear cams are a luxury anymore. The future, rear view mirrors that are actually rear camera displays such as what Nissan's developing that virtually erases the pillars, rear seats, and even backseat passengers from your view. Bottom line, it really pays to double check what's behind you before you back up and that there's a rear camera in your next car. Coming up, variable valve timing. It's a big deal and we demystify it when CNET on Cars rolls on. When McLaren re-entered the road car game in 2009, everybody got a little bit excited because McLaren had come along and said, brilliant. To that effect, they've launched this, the 650S. You know what I think this car's about? I think this is a big carbon fiber extended middle finger straight at Ferrari. Find more from the XCAR team of CNET UK at cnet.com slash XCAR. Welcome back to CNET on Cars, coming to you from our home at the Marin Clubhouse of Cars de Widiac, just north of the Golden Gate Bridge. You know, one of the most ubiquitous revolutions under the hood in the last few years has been variable valve timing. Just about every car maker brags about it, but they almost never tell you what it does or how it does it. That's our job and a great CarTech 101. <laughs> First, a quick lesson in engine valves and what they do. On this big old cutaway Ford Shelby motor, you can see them clearly. The intake valves open to let the air and gas into the cylinder. The exhaust valves open later to let the burned air and gas out of the cylinder, down into the exhaust. Valves are operated by camshafts. You see these guys up here, they turn with the engine, and these off-center lobes that are mounted on them push the valves open or not as they turn around. These are dual overhead cams. There's one cam for exhaust valves, a separate one for intake valves. Also notice this engine has four valves per cylinder, like many do these days, if you've got more area to let the engine breathe in and out. But here's the problem. A strictly mechanical system operates the same way at all RPMs and all engine loads. That's not ideal for MPG, horsepower, or emissions. You want to vary this behavior at different points of the engine's rev range. That's why we have variable valve timing. 
and it changes three parameters. Valve timing. At what points in the engine's rotation do the valves open and close? Valve duration. How long the valve stays open once it is? And valve lift. How far a valve moves off its seat when it opens? So varying all those valve events, as they're called, allows this engine, and most importantly, its electronic control unit, can constantly make a call to get the most power, the best MPG, and the lowest emissions all at once. Now, I could do an hour on why that works, but here are just a couple simple examples. If you leave this exhaust valve open longer on one stroke, you get all the exhaust blown out of there. That leaves a fully open and clean cylinder to take in the maximum gas and air on the next gulp, and that could give you more power. On the other hand, if you close that exhaust valve a little sooner, you leave some exhaust in here. That fills part of the cylinder, and therefore you take in less air and fuel the next time. That kind of creates a virtually smaller engine for a moment, and that could give you better MPG. Now, the mechanisms that allow these valves to change their behavior are almost as numerous as there are manufacturers of engines. Here are just a few examples. First of all, some cars have multiple sets of lobes on their camshafts, and different lobes of different shapes are used at different points in the engine's operation. Here's another example. Sometimes you will change the relationship between the rotation of the crank and the rotation of the camshaft, so they aren't always locked one to one. Another technology is what's called an eccentric cam drive. So the engine's turning at a certain RPM, but eccentric drives here on the ends of the cams allow them to accelerate and decelerate their rotation. That gives you a degree of control as well. Now, who invented all this variable valve timing stuff? Interestingly, Fiat is often given credit as having the first mainstream production-ready system, dating back to a 1969 patent application. But today, you know it as multi-air. We saw it recently in the new Jeep Cherokee, now owned by Fiat, of course. It's their version of changing valve events using hydraulic pressure out of the oil system. The most famous kind of valve timing, yes, valve timing can be famous, is Honda's VTEC, the source of one of the biggest memes ever on the internet. And just about every car maker has their own brand of variable valve timing, and they push it hard, which is weird considering how few car buyers have any idea what it is. But now at least you've got a pretty good idea of how this one technology has dramatically improved how engines raise MPG, increase horsepower, and lower emissions. It's one of the great revolutions in engineering in cars in the last few decades.